You have a spinal tap or lumbar puncture and the fluid is sent off to the lab and you get back a lab report that says that you have bands or oligoclonal bands or you don't have bands. What exactly does this mean? This is perhaps the most commonly misinterpreted test in all of neurology and I'm going to explain both technically what oligoclonal bands are and how to interpret this test in the context of multiple sclerosis and other neurological diseases. So oligoclonal is a big scary word, so let's take a look at the second word bands first. What does that mean? So you have the spinal tap, and I have a separate video explaining what a spinal tap is if you want to take a look, and they take the cerebral spinal fluid and they put it on a container with gel, a thick viscous material. Then they attach this container of gel to an, a machine that creates an electric field. This is called gel electrophoresis. It's designed to separate particles based on their molecular weight. Now you can use it for different things like DNA or RNA, but in this case we're looking at proteins and we're specifically interested in certain proteins in the spinal fluid called antibodies or immunoglobins which can be present in multiple sclerosis and other diseases of the nervous system. And so you put them in the gel and then you activate the electric field. Now proteins are normally uncharged, but they're mixed with a solvent that gives them a negative charge. Hence they get pulled to the positive end of the electric field and they start moving. Now the big molecules with a large molecular weight, they tend to get stuck in the gel and they move very slowly, whereas the smaller molecules tend to move more quickly through the gel. And so let's say you have an antibody or protein. It and its buddies all have the same size and molecular weight, so they all move at exactly the same speed and they separate from the other proteins. And so you form a band. So a band is literally a stripe or band on the gel that you can see at the end of the procedure. Now let's move back to the first word which is oligoclonal which is really two words oligo and clonal. So oligo means several or many not just one several and clonal means clone. And so when your body produces antibodies, you produce many of the same antibody. And an antibody is a protein normally involved in fighting viruses, bacteria, and fungi, and it has a certain target or antigen. For instance, perhaps it binds to a certain viral surface protein, and all of the clones have exactly the same molecular properties, the same molecular weight, and hence they'll form one band on the gel because they'll all move the exact same distance. So oligoclonal means several clones, in other words, several different antibodies, not just one single antibody, and hence they'll show up as multiple bands on the gel because they have different molecular weights and different molecular properties. So now we move to the interpretation of the test and oligoclonal bands, and we'll start with by far the most common reason to send a multiple sclerosis panel and look for oligoclonal bands, which is to diagnose multiple sclerosis. And so it helps to understand what type of disease multiple sclerosis is. It's an immune mediated disease isolated to the central nervous system. Unlike diseases such as lupus, it doesn't affect the kidneys or the skin. It just causes inflammation of the central nervous system. Also, it's a polyclonal disease, meaning there isn't a single target of the immune system. There are numerous targets of the immune system, even though the inflammation mainly targets myelin, the fatty sheath of the nervous system, it targets many different antigens or surfaces of different proteins in myelin. It's not just a single target. For instance, with neuromyelitis optica, that can be primarily associated with one specific antibody, such as anti-aquaporin-4, some people with myasthenia gravis may have a single abnormal antibody, anti-acetylcholine receptor antibody, for example, in some people. But many diseases that are autoimmune are polyclonal, like rheumatoid arthritis, and multiple sclerosis is one of those diseases. So when we look for the spinal tap results, we're looking for evidence of inflammation in the central nervous system that is not in the rest of the body, and that is polyclonal. In other words, there are numerous immune targets, and we can determine that based on having numerous abnormal bands on gel electrophoresis. So the key finding on the spinal tap that's seen in about 90% of people with multiple sclerosis is having more than one band 
that is in the spinal fluid that is not in the blood or serum. So when you have a spinal tap and test for the multiple sclerosis panel, you do both the spinal tap and a blood test at the same time, ideally within hours, so that they can be compared. And what we're looking for is to have two or more bands representing antibodies or immunoglobins that are not present in the blood. Because if they are also present in the blood, that does not indicate isolated inflammation in the nervous system that is typical of multiple sclerosis. For example, if you have five bands in the cerebrospinal fluid but not in the blood, that is a positive tap, potentially consistent with multiple sclerosis. If you have two bands in the cerebrospinal fluid but not in the blood, that could also be consistent with multiple sclerosis. Now, if you have no bands, obviously that's normal. If you have one band, that's also considered normal, even if it's isolated to the cerebrospinal fluid. But also, if you have numerous bands that are present in the blood but also present in the cerebrospinal fluid, that can also be normal. It can also be seen in a traumatic tap. In other words, when the cerebrospinal fluid gets contaminated with a little bit of blood because the needle is going through your skin to get to the fluid, and so it could easily be contaminated a little bit. That finding is also seen sometimes in people with other autoimmune diseases affecting the nervous system, such as lupus cerebritis. Now I'll move to a few caveats of interpreting this test. The first is that even the classic finding in multiple sclerosis, having more than one oligoclonal band that is not in the serum, is not 100% specific for MS. It can be seen in other diseases, such as, for instance, other autoimmune diseases of the nervous system, like neuromyelitis optica, or autoimmune encephalitis, or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, or even central nervous system infections, such as Lyme disease or neurosyphilis. So it's not 100% specific, and of course, there are rare false positives. Another thing I've come across is people will have a normal spinal tap and be diagnosed with multiple sclerosis anyway, and the diagnosis will end up being erroneous and figured out several years later. Now, of course, not everyone with MS has an abnormal spinal tap, but a normal spinal tap should be regarded as a huge red flag. For instance, I've seen someone have one band and someone interprets that as consistent with multiple sclerosis. Again, one band is considered normal and is insufficient to support a diagnosis of MS. Or I've seen people have bands in the serum and cerebral spinal fluid. Again, this is a very common finding, not typical of multiple sclerosis and should not be regarded as being consistent with MS. Another thing I've seen is someone does have an autoimmune disease of the central nervous system and they have a spinal tap that does show multiple bands not in the serum and they get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis even though they don't meet the diagnostic criteria of multiple sclerosis. Now in the MS diagnostic criteria the spinal tap can be used to demonstrate dissemination in time, demonstration that this is a chronic disease and I have a specific video on the MS diagnostic criteria if you want to take a look. However it cannot be used to demonstrate dissemination in space, evidence of injury to different parts of the nervous system that is characteristic of multiple sclerosis. It's multiple sclerosis, multiple sclerotic areas, multiple scars. For example, let's say someone has optic neuritis and they have an MRI scan of the brain and spine showing other lesions typical of MS even if there were no symptoms related to them and they have a spinal tap that shows multiple bands not in the serum, it would be appropriate to diagnose that person with multiple sclerosis. However, let's say someone has optic neuritis but their MRI of the brain and spine are normal and they have no history of prior symptoms suggesting other nervous system injury. Even if they have a spinal tap that shows bands isolated to the central uh, nervous system and not in the serum, that is not sufficient to make a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis because there is no evidence of dissemination in space. So I've seen instances where someone has optic neuritis or transverse myelitis or acute disseminated encephalomyelitis and they don't have multiple sclerosis but they have an abnormal spinal tap but an abnormal spinal tap can be seen in other diseases of the central nervous system. The optic neuritis for instance could occur on its own or could be part of another chronic disease such as Creon, chronic recurrent inflammatory optic neuritis or neuromyelitis optica. So that's another thing to be hesitant about with diagnosis. Now just to back up a little bit, obviously a spinal tap is a very unpleasant test. It's painful, it can cause headaches, no one really wants to do it. And the good news is that less and less people with multiple sclerosis, in my opinion, need a spinal tap due to advances in MRI, making it easier to make a diagnosis of MS without a spinal tap. So historically, virtually everyone suspected to have MS had a spinal tap. Now that's no longer the 
case, and in my opinion, someone with typical symptoms, exam findings, and MRI findings of multiple sclerosis probably don't need a spinal tap. I do think it can be useful in certain cases where the diagnosis is ambiguous or to check for other nervous system diseases that could mimic multiple sclerosis, for example. Obviously, it's a pretty lousy test to do, and people have looked for other biomarkers of MS. One thing people talked about several years ago is looking for oligoclonal bands in the tears. That would be quite an improvement, but it hasn't made it to prime time yet. Also, there's certain advances in MRI where we can see a central venue within the lesions of multiple sclerosis that's characteristic of multiple sclerosis. That may make a spinal tap less and less necessary for fewer and fewer people. I understand this video is a bit technical and may have made you more confused than you already were, but I'm happy to field questions in the comments below and let me know if you have suggestions for future videos.